All right, we are live. I've got the one, the only, Ryan Lundquist, SacramentoAppraisalBlog.com, Sac Appraiser on uh, Instagram. Are you Sac Appraiser on uh, um, X too? Yep, on X, Twitter, whatever we want to call it. Yes. Yeah, I know. I almost called it Twitter and I realized it's got a new name. Um, super stoked to have you on today, brother. I know, you know, not just people in the Sacramento area where you're an absolute rock star, but, you know, nationwide um, really enjoy following all your cool graphs. If they're lucky enough to see you live, they get a taste of your stand up comedy. Um, but, you know, <laughs> you're, you're somebody who's closely followed um, the real estate market, the trends and data and whatnot for, uh, you know, a decade and a half, probably, right? Didn't your blog turn 14 or something last year? Uh, it's actually turning 15 tomorrow. So, um, you know, continue at a time. So, oh, yeah. yeah. Early, early happy birthday to SacramentoAppraisalBlog.com. Um, thanks for joining, man. There's so much to talk about in regards to real estate. Um, I'll uh, open it up. What What do you want to talk about? What's, what's on your mind um, at this moment in time, mid-February 2024? Yeah, well, uh, first, hey, thanks for having me, and I'm um, glad everyone's joining. I can see the comments, so hi, everyone. Uh, Kevin, glad that it's uh, not raining in Florida any longer. Um, but I think this year, what we've noticed in Sacramento is what we're seeing in a lot of markets across the country is that, you know, it's sort of the year that doesn't suck as bad as 2023. <laughs> so we're, we're getting, um, in Sacramento, we've seen more new listings, more sales, and more pending so far compared to one year ago. And so, you know, that's, those are positive signs. Um, you know, on a realistic level, we're really, really far from normal still. And so it's just, but I, I think that the real estate community and, the, you know, buyers and sellers are looking and going, hey, you know, more is the direction we want to go. And so it, it has felt like good news. Um, but, you know, otherwise the market's heating up. We're seeing a traditional spring market so far. Um, I think uh, what I'm hearing from some people is that it's 2021 again, but, you know, I'm not seeing that at all in the stats. Um it can get really crazy out there in some price ranges, but it's not like you list a property and it goes 70,000 above asking and, you know, removal of all contingencies. Like some of that stuff happens, but not to the extreme of what we saw in 2021. So I just always say, hey, keep it in check. But that's kind of where we're at. Um, a lot of conversation with a lot of things right now, but, um, you know, uh, happy to talk about any of it if people have questions and such. Yeah, I want people who are in the comments fire away with your questions while while we got Ryan here. I've got tons of my own questions, so so I'll I'll fill the void while we're waiting for people to you know think about the the questions they want answered. You mentioned, and I know too that you know things can get sensationalized. Be like, oh my gosh, it's so hard. One house, one time, I saw I got forty offers, or their specific scenario. You know, they love a house which happens to be in a great neighborhood at a great price shows well. So of course other people like it. Of course you competed against 11 offers. Um, I think you shared a stat that in Sacramento, um, something like 50% of listings were getting into contract within the first 10 days. Um, you know, it's, it's somewhere around there. Um, say in 2021, literally the whole entire year, half the market sold in seven days or less, just, I mean, crazy. Right. But, um, yeah, I mean, within two weeks, half the properties are really moving fast. Um, the numbers are a lot closer to normal for days on market. It's still a little bit more competitive, but it's no longer that 2021 market where I always say that, when a property was listed for sale on Thursday, it's not in contract on Monday or Tuesday, then you're like, well, what's wrong with it? You know, and yeah. um, right now we just look and go, you know, it might need a few weeks on the market, you know, but it, it's still um, divided because you see some properties that are moving within two weeks and then others that, you know, need price reductions. They're spending 30 to 60 days on the market. And so it's really bifurcated in that regard still. But um, you said multiple offers. I just pulled February sales so far. And there's that one outlier that has 60 offers. And, you know, because it was priced $200,000 below what it was worth, right? That's the recipe. If you want that many offers, take a $500,000 house, price it at 250. You know what I'm saying? Um, you know, and so, but when you look at the number of offers, um, about 4% had, you know, more than 10. 
And so it's not like 90% of the market gets 10 or more. And I'm not trying to diminish how competitive it is, especially between 400 and 600,000. It's just, it's not 2021 though, either. Um, you know, that's what the stats are showing. Sweet. Yeah. It's uh, it feels competitive. And I know that for first time home buyers, I got quite a lot of them. Um, it can be discouraging uh, because the nice houses that are selling fast are the ones that are nice houses to, to everybody. Um, and so I think that's where, like you said, bifurcated, if it's like, you know, on a, you know, not so desirable street in a not so nice neighborhood and not so good condition. And it's got a funky layout. Like it's been on the market for 35 days. Nobody wants the yep. other ugly duckling, but the thing that's um, great neighborhood priced. Well, um, you know, it's got 11, 12 offers and people are like, Oh my gosh, it's impossible again. Um, so I know you, you mentioned sales and I honestly don't look at this stuff a ton. It intrigues me, but sometimes I just get busy writing mortgages and analyzing mortgage structure to where I can't look at it. In January, I was following your stats. What did we end up? Like 15% more sales than last year? Um, gosh, I didn't look at it for the region. Um, you know, that's somewhere. Actually, let me see. It's right on my desktop. Um, it depends on the county, though. It's all over the place. Some counties are 5% or, you know, 10 or 20. Um, let me just find it real quick. Sorry here, Matt. Um, just bear with me. All good, man. It's important data because I, I also was going to ask you if you're if you're keeping tabs and you have an idea of what February looks like halfway through February. Um, I, you know, I don't with, um, February, but hang on. Um, sorry about that. Let me, uh, it's right on my blog. I have actually a, a stats tab for nine local counties. And so, um, it's Sacramento appraisalblog.com slash stats. And yeah, you look in the region, uh, number of sales up by 11%. Um, like I said, that really varies by County. Um, you know, let's see, Placer was up you know, 12%, Sacramento up 6%, um, El Dorado nine. And so somewhere within that ballpark, um, the number of listings was up about 15%. Um, in February so far, I think we're going to go the number of new listings, maybe 20 to 25% compared to one year ago. And so it's starting to ramp up a little bit more, which is good. Um, and it's still really, it's too, it's too early to really look at, um, you know, pendings and, and sales, but um, but hopefully those are keeping track. I, I will say that we're getting new listings and the market is not really getting cold because there's still so little on, on the market. Um, if we keep seeing these rates tick up, then that could change things. But um, so far, I think, you know, 7% isn't too bad. Um, the market got really cool when we hit 8% in the fall. Um, we had really dull sales in November and December. I think that was a byproduct of low rates. And then these properties got in contract and we just saw, um, you know, fewer sales happening. So um, that's kind of where we're at. And speaking of, I mean, Matt, what's going on with rates? I thought everyone and their mom in uh, November and December, they're like, trust me, by June, we're going to be at five and a half percent. It feels like exactly the same thing as one year ago when they're like, trust me, or May 12th is the day or whatever, whatever that was. <laughs> and then it's just like, did we not learn from last year? <laughs> I think that regardless of how many times you get something wrong, there's still people, probably myself included, and I'll, I'll just admit to guilt now, um, going to continue to have, you know, thoughts and predictions for the future. Um, and, you know, I don't think many people predicted that inflation would be as sticky as it is. It's it's always so weird too. you know, I'm, I'm not an econ major or somebody who digs into like every single piece of that, you know, like I, I literally stay in my lane and it's like, I know mortgages really well. I know how to structure a mortgage, but some of the stuff you look at it and you're like, you know, you're using data and some of the stuff that's, that's literally like a huge portion of how they measure inflation is got data in it that lags so much, you know, like, like rental costs you know, where we write one year leases and, and, you know, like it's going to be a long time before that, you know, lagging data catches up. Um, it, it, it makes for an interesting ride, I think, if nothing else, but, um, you know, for, for us tracking like the 10 year treasury and tracking when the fed is going to cut the fed funds rate. I think March is all, but off the table. 
Um, and so inflation is going to be sticky, which in turn is going to create like higher for longer in the, in the mortgage rate environment. But I, I feel like it might sound stupid coming out, but it's like inevitably rates are going to come down in the next yeah. 12 to 18 months. Like the Fed is not going to keep the Fed's funds rate above 5%. Like there's not going to be a need for like the, the, like, immense tightening that's 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 gone on and so it might not be you know that the short term predictions are very accurate but if you ask me to wager Q1 of 2025 will rates be higher or lower than they are today I'd be pretty confident I'd be willing to put up a large wager on that um will it be five and a half or will it be six and an eighth I honestly don't know. And I won't, I won't profess to know, you know, everyone always wants you to make a guess, but um, as rates trend down, this is, this is an interesting topic because I was looking at this today, Ryan. Um, what people who are in the market, some understand it and some don't, but I hope that maybe I can educate some people. Be careful what you wish for. As much as a lot of people would be like, wake me up when rates are 6% because at 7%, the mortgage doesn't make sense for me at 500,000, I'm not going to buy. If and when rates go to 6%, n- undoubtedly like that pulls a bunch of demand into the market and that house that's 500,000 will just have a lot more competition and you know, the supply and demand dynamic and rules, it's more than likely going to sell at a premium. So the price can be pushed up. So I did a little example today on a video I recorded where, you know, if you buy it at 500 at a 7% rate, or you buy it at 530 at a 6.375, you've got the same payment. And, And I think that that's what's likely to happen is rates come down, it drives demand and has some upward pressure on prices. I'm not saying prices are going to go up 10 or 15%, but if rates come down, I, I I personally know about 111 people on the sideline right now. They're pre-approved clients yeah. in my um, system. And if more of them come and start submitting offers, start competing against each other, and other people are, are seeing the same in their mortgage business or their real estate business, it just, it has an upward pressure on um, demand and prices. So, no, definitely. Well, yeah, and I think it's, um, you know, it's very healthy to see buyers and sellers able to participate in the housing market. You know, that's a sign of health. Um, To me, it's never about prices, but it's about volume. You know, how many people are participating? And if they're not, then, you know, that's problematic. But I think so far this year, as we're getting, you know, a little bit more of sellers and buyers back, you know, that is a healthy sign. But yeah, presumably, if rates did drop, then that gets more of each category back. Both categories need affordability. Um, And I think, you know, we're very far from the math working for a lot of people. Um, In a lot of my market talks, I I talk about how last year there were 15,000 missing listings in Sacramento in the the four county region. And that's a really glaring number. But, you know, that doesn't mean that there's going to be like 15,000 people waiting to sell, because I think there's a lot of people where they're like, I'm not going to (laughs) sell. I'm I'm sitting pretty, you know, but so I think right now we're in a place where, um, you know, such low supply, it's kept prices from going down and it's kept the market competitive. And, you know, we really need a sharper change in order to change the um, dynamic in a sharp way. And, you know, right now that's just not what we have. And so, um, you know, but the hard part, Matt, is that there's, there's really not a mechanism in place to release a lot of supply. We're seeing sellers thaw out very, you know, just a little bit right now, which is good, but, you know, we'd really need a a change to affordability or economic carnage. Um, One thing I'm watching is unemployment rate, credit card debt, all that stuff, but it's still really at low levels, you know, mortgage delinquencies, really low levels. And so, you know, I think as much as uh, all the doom profits on Twitter are, you know, looking at that, it's just, we're not in a place where that's really swaying the market. Um, Are there red flags on the horizon? Sure. You know, let's, let's watch this. We're starting to see that unemployment just tick up, but it's just, it's very, very far from those 2009 levels when we peaked out. 
Agree. I'm going to come back to that too, because I want to talk doom and gloom. I think it's a, it's a, it's a fun subject, whether you agree or disagree. And I'm an open-minded guy to, to listen to and, and look at some of that stuff. I just want to say what's up to my buddy, all nighter hider was hanging out with him that this weekend at that, uh, one rental at a time, uh, conference out in Vegas. Um, good to see you, brother. Curtis Craig following on Facebook. Hope you're doing well, my man. Why did mortgage rates go up recently? I'll give you my best 30 second answer. Um, the, the fed, um, who controls the fed funds rate, not directly tied to mortgage rates, but they, they rhyme wanted to see inflation, uh, coming down to their 2% target inflation data that came out showed that inflation wasn't coming down at the pace or towards the 2% that they liked. And so, you know, that had a negative impact on mortgage interest rates. It went from like, they're cutting in March, definitely to there's no chance they're cutting in March. And so that's what we saw with a couple different inflation reports, um, last week. Um, that's, that's my two cents. I don't know if you had anything else to add there, uh, Ryan, but no, no, I'm just seeing Brian, uh, in the chat. He just got his tooth pulled today. So Brian, you know, um, we're thinking about you. <laughs> yep. Hope your tooth is well. And thank you for the super chat. That's, that's, uh, kind, that's generous. We're going to have to split this, Ryan. Next time I see you coffee's on coffee's on Brian. He's got, you know, a $10, uh, super chat coming to us. So, uh, Brian's the man. Well, yeah, Brian really is the man out there in Massachusetts. Um, I appreciate the uh, the ten dollars. I appreciate the support and following all that. And, you know, I was going to say, Matt, if I could jump in. Um, uh, one dynamic I'm noting, besides you know market conditions, inventory, all that stuff, um, is on a practical level that w what's hard about 2024 is actually pulling comps. And so, if there's investors or real estate agents, appraisers listening, um, you know, think about it this way. In Sacramento County, we're missing about 40% of the pre-2020 normal for volume. Placer is more like 25%, El Dorado 25. And so it's different everywhere. But that effectively means when you're in a neighborhood pulling comps, you're going to have 25 to 40% fewer comps to choose from. And so I think that a market like today, as I approach a neighborhood and I'm trying to figure out what is this thing worth, I find what I have to do. I have to look much further in time and go, all right, let me look at everything in 2023, everything in 2022 and 2021. And I find myself really looking at what's going on um, with older sales. How has the market changed since then? But also what's going on in nearby neighborhoods just to be able to see the trend. And so um, I wrote about that last week on my blog. Um, and I joked that, you know, Chuck Norris doesn't have any problem with this. You know, um, the, you know, the comps come to him and tell him where, where value is at. But, um, you know, we're not, we're just mere mortals, folks. <laughs> yeah. Chuck Norris doesn't go to find comps. The comps find him, which is a good point. I saw something today. Or maybe I heard my buddy Mike Zuber talking about it. Um, the average length in a home just a few short years ago was less than 10 years. And I think that to, today's average um, somewhere was reported to be 12 years. And so people are staying in homes longer. They're selling less often, um, which is going to mean, you know, there's just not as many sales and as many comps for, you know, an appraiser to find or, you know, for the case of, these poor home buyers I got pre-approved. They're just waiting for listings to come on. That was something I wanted to come back to, Ryan, because I think it's interesting uh, when the Doomers talk about a housing crash. A public school dummy like me, who you know doesn't profess to be you know an economics PhD, I know that in order for home prices to really see a drastic decrease, you know, for for there to be a quote unquote crash. There has to be a ton of inventory. There has to be an over glut of, of supply. Um, and that's got to, you know, far outweigh the demand. Um, is there any scenario in which you see that happening? And, and before I even let you answer, I was talking to somebody today who was part of a program because they have, they were having trouble making their payments. There's more programs. Like we saw um, people enter into forbearance. And so even if there's economic hardship, even if there's, you know, more unemployment, 
there's also more programs in place where people are going to like have tools to stay in their homes where there's like the foreclosure crisis of the, you know, 2008, 2009. Like, I think it's quite near impossible, but I don't know, maybe you've got some ideas or some thoughts on the other side. I'm always open to hear it, even though I just, you know, the, the doomers just say it's happening because it's happening. Home prices have gone up by 40%. They must fall. Home prices are this far from 2019. They must come down. What do you got for me? Well, I mean, I think to be fair, we've had a volume crash, like hands down in Sacramento County. It was the worst volume we've seen in many decades, even worse in 2007. In the region as a whole, it was like just above 2007 levels. And so What's strange about today is that we've had a volume crash without a price crash because of the X factor that listings aren't coming to the market. And so say last year, we had 21,000 people list their homes. And it's kind of funny because a lot of people think nobody's listing. Like, but that number should have been like, you know, 37 almost. But but here's the thing, in 2008 at the, you know, we had 52,000 listings. And so it's like, we're not seeing sellers rush the market due to needing to sell economic carnage. And so, like I said earlier, that that's put a lot of pressure on prices to either stay the same or, or to rise. It's put a lot of competition in the market. And so it's almost like we have 2007 volume vibes with some of the worst sales ever, but that's coupled with competition that feels like very early 2020 before things got crazy. And so, um, you know, I don't have a crystal ball. I'd say on one hand, there we have. Do you have this dynamic where the market's really tight? And I would say that it, it's very, very challenging to see prices crash in a scenario like that. On the other hand, we just have to concede that we're in new territory where, um, like Mike Zuber always says, you know, the, the Fed broke the housing market. And I think we have to concede that maybe the traditional rules don't exactly apply perfectly. Um, now right now, as we've seen this um, play out over the past year and a half, almost two years, um, you know, the traditional rules have applied, right? But, um, but you know, I, I don't, I don't see. There's no downward pressure on prices at the moment. I'll say that. Um, but yeah, the future, it's kind of like predicting rates. Nobody knows with certainty. Um, but it's a good sign at least to see volume improve. Um, I do agree with the with the doomers that it would be really healthy to see prices go down. Had 2020 not happened, we probably would be declining because the market was due for a correction. But that's not what has played out. Um, I don't get to make the rules. If I did, you know, I, I, I'd love to see prices come down. It's just not what we have right now. Yeah. I mean, I think too, that's, that's, that's the thing about, uh, you know, somebody who owns real estate or somebody who's an active real estate investor. Like I'd love to see a 30 or 40% discount. It'd be great. Like the buyers that I'm working with would be stoked about it. The investor buddies, uh, of mine and, you know, myself as an investor be stoked about it. Just, it doesn't seem to be in the cards, um, for, for something for sure. like that to happen. Um, you know, yeah. In, that, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I, I was just going to say, yeah. And, what to piggyback on what you're saying, like in, at this time in 2007, you know, we had 11 months worth of housing supply and lately that's been more like a month and a half. And so it's just, it's a really different dynamic. That doesn't mean that it's healthy today. It, it just means that it, it's different. And so it's a, it's an awkward comparison to be like, look what happened last time. This is the template or the formula for the future. And I just don't think that that's the case. It's sort of like looking to a past relationship and thinking, here's how relationships go. Well, yeah, maybe there's some similarities, but I think we just have to concede that, you know, not every relationship or not every market cycle, not every kid is going to be built the same exact way. There's going to be similarities and, and some glaring differences. Right. Yeah. Um, cool. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, the first one to admit who knows what's going to happen? And we're definitely, like you said, in uncharted territory. What do you see playing out in 2024 um, in the real estate market? Knowing what you know and, and you know, you followed closely and you've graphed out things. Um, you know, you can answer this in a number of ways. Just, you know, put numbers around, like, what do you think sales volume will be at the end of the year? Um, what do you think um, prices will do? you know, and, and home price appreciation over the course of the year. I won't ask, ask you to predict rates. I'll, I'll, I'll be the one stuck with uh, wrongly predicting interest rates, but yeah, prices and volume, what's, what's your guesstimates for 24? So 
I would say a typical spring increase um, so far. That's what I'm seeing, even in the pending contracts. And um, remember, one of the reasons why prices go up is because larger homes sell. And so it's not just like straight up, like prices are going to go up five to 6%. It's like some of that is just larger home selling, right? Um, volume, if we're lucky, 10 to 15% more. Um, you know, it's sort of like the year where I think we're poised to see more. And that's the hope, but we also have to just look and just recognize that, you know, what happens with rates, what happens with inflation, the economy, these things all matter and they could be, you know, a quick monkey wrench into the trend. But if everything persists, rates remain, you know, somewhat, you know, where they're at right now or a little lower than um, I wouldn't be surprised to see 10% more local volume, maybe more, maybe 15 if we're lucky, um, you know, but it's kind of like the question I have is, if rates shot up, then do we start to see more sellers, you know, list their homes? If that trend kind of continues and then buyers slump, then that could create more softness in the market. And so, you know, it's hard to predict, um, but it's sort of like my my friend Jonathan Miller in New York. I like what he said that, you know, 2023 was the year of disappointment and 2024 will be the year of less disappointment. And so, <laughs> you know, or and, or like I said, in layman's terms, you know, the market sucked in 2023. It's poised to suck a little less in 2024, um, which is actually really positive news for those who work in real estate. That's awesome. Yeah. For, for, for real estate and mortgage folks. Uh, the market, you know, is going to suck a little bit less for for all of us. So that's that's a good thing. And quite honestly, like your prediction of of if rates ticked up and things softened a little bit and some listings stayed on a little bit longer and new stuff came to market, um, it wasn't that long ago. You know, you could look at Q4 of 23 or even Q4 of 22. I remember how it felt to be working with buyers because as a mortgage broker, that's the only side I'm really on is the buy side and mm -hmm it was great. You could take your time in putting in an offer. You could submit an offer that had seller credits attached. You could offer below what they were asking and you had a little bit of leverage. Um, so it was a great thing. Um, the thing that I'm afraid of, quite honestly, is things go in the other direction where rates come down and, um, you know, like not only volume in in home sales but demand is 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 kind of correlated with mortgage interest rates with the lower the rates go the more demand comes onto the market and so it it creates a competitive environment which is not one that's good for buyers so buyers are wishing for lower interest rates that hurt them when it comes time to actually submit offers and get it accepted on a house so um i don't know if that's just me or if that's something that you see, I, I know that from your seat um, and, you know, you're working appraisals and talking to tons of real estate agents, um, you get a lot of input and feedback. What's your general feel for what, you know, buyers are saying, or maybe real estate agents are saying in 2024 about like what they're hoping for or what, what they're kind of up to right now? I think it's, well, first of all, I think it's a mixed bag when I talk to agents um, and and I do a lot of speaking and I have a lot of, you know, conversations in my DMs, just like you do. Um, I think it's a mixed bag because part of it depends on, you know, where people are working and, you know, the buyers are working with. And so I might, you know, have someone who's like, we just had this, you know, there were 60 offers on a house and waived all contingencies and, you know, we gave away our child and, you know, all that stuff. But then the next person will say like, yeah, there's no traffic at the open house at all. And so, but overall what I'm seeing in the stats and what I'm hearing in the trenches is yeah, a market that's heating up buyers needing to act immediately for the good stuff. Okay. The stuff that's overpriced is just sitting there and it will not move. Um, I find one of the consistent themes that I hear and that I see in the stats is that, you know, buyers are very picky. They're patient. They're not desperate. Um, they're not going to sort of go get married in a heartbeat. They're really thinking this thing through because if a buyer is paying a higher mortgage uh, payment in today's market, then they're going to be discerning. And so I think that's good to see. Um, I think that part is is very healthy. I want buyers to make good decisions. I don't want them to be rushed in things. I don't want to see a market like 2021 where, you know, you had to go astronomically above on so many escrows 
waive all the contingencies. And, you know, we get inklings of that today. Don't get me wrong. You know, but I think having more balance is, you know, is key. It's just, it, it's hard when those listings aren't coming in the market because that keeps us from, you know, from getting there. So, but yeah, I mean, overall that's, um, I think there's some buyer, a little bit of buyer fatigue. Um, I also find though that buyers are, very well prepared. Um, it seems like that they're not surprised at market conditions in a lot of cases. Um, I think the agents and loan officers are talking to them about what they need to do. Um, they're certainly more used to the idea of 7% rates. And so sort of that shock from in early 2022 when rates doubled, I think that shock's gone and the buyers that are here today are, are very aware of of what it takes. And yeah, we're missing a ton of buyers. We know that. I see that in the stats, but the buyers that are here are um, are ready for the market um, when when it comes and ready for that right property when it comes. Um, so, you know, some of them, there still are more cash buyers in today's market um, in terms of the percentage. It's just the pool of buyers is smaller and there just happen to be more buyers who um, have cash today. So uh, really not a different number than last year. It's about the same number. It's just a higher percentage, though. Um, and hey, hey, Tony, what's up? Good to see you. Thanks for the kind words. Oh, Mr. Tony Duke, what's up, my man? Another guy who's been in the real estate game for a long time. This guy got his license when I was in high school, I think. Uh, I, won't, I won't say anything more that's going to give away uh, my man Tony's age. But I wanted to tell you, like, you hit the nail on the head when it comes to buyers being discerning. I had that conversation recently because if nothing else, I've got a lot of data and feedback from real life buyers and, and the buyer sentiment on that, that side. They are, like you said, kind of come to grips with, okay, the interest rates are higher. It's going to come with a higher uh, mortgage payment than I might have liked or been used to or, or wanted. And so when they're pre-approved and they've come to terms that, okay, it's going to be a $4,000 a month mortgage payment and I qualify for it. I want to become a homeowner, but it's not just going to be any old house. If I'm going to pay $4,000 a month, it's going to be the house that fits for me and my family. And so I'm seeing a lot of that, Ryan. And what I'm seeing is with inventory being so low, a buyer might go out and be super motivated because the house that fits like their criteria perfect is there. If they don't get that house, let's. I'm not trying to just buy any old house, and yeah. so they'll take a break, however long it takes, because you know, with these rates at the current price points, they're just not willing to settle. Which, to your point, is a really good and healthy thing. When it was yeah. like, I've got to get a piece of real estate. I'm going up against 20 offers. I'm waving all my contingencies. I'm just going to throw it out and hope it sticks. I'm, you know, sight unseen. Like that's. That's unhealthy. So, uh, no, yeah, um, unhealthy in real estate and in dating or marriage, right? Um, you know, coming to you today with marriage advice, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, but I find that it's it's the year of the lifestyle buyer still, same dynamic as one year ago. Um, and um, one interesting thing that I'm seeing in the stats is um, like most neighborhoods had lower volume in 2023 compared to 2022, like by far. You know what? One local neighborhood that didn't is Sun City Lincoln Hills, 55 plus, actually had more sales in 2023 compared to one year ago. And so what's interesting is that I think that underscores the power of lifestyle. And you have, you know, um, people who are aging, looking to downsize, that want to move to a 55 plus community where it makes sense regardless of market conditions. Um, and there's actually more cash at 57% of sales were cash uh, last year in the neighborhood. In that um, Sun City neighborhood? Yeah, yeah. It's usually like 45, 46, 47. So it's usually high, but but again, it's that market of lifestyle. And so when you look at who's listing, um, who's buying, you know, there's, it's a lot of buyers, their lifestyle is lining up um, with market conditions. So it's first time home, um, home buyers, people who are leaving the state, uh, people who are downsizing, upsizing, you know, have changes in their family, um, a lot of divorce. Um, a lot of the appraisals on my side um, that I do are when the kids inherit a property because mom or dad passed away. And it's more difficult to divide assets between um, siblings at 7%. And so I find that, you know, a lot of properties will hit the market. Like one on my desk that I need to finish as soon as we're done here, that one's going to list for sale. Um, and I find quite a few like that. Like sometimes they do hold onto the house. 
Same thing with divorce. Like sometimes they do hold on to it. It's just it's just a little more difficult to um, you know to keep that though instead of release it to the market. And so, but otherwise you have so many other people who I think are in this mode or pattern of of sitting just because the math doesn't work. Right. Yeah. And that's where, uh, you know, I come in as a mortgage advisor and, you know, for every 10 conversations I have on what it would look like if I sold and 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 bought something in this nicer neighborhood or with these better schools. And, you know, the, the, the math just doesn't math for people, which is fine. But that's, you know, one of the reasons why that average length in a home is up to 12 years. People aren't, you know, as as apt to do as much moving around when payment is going to double or triple. Want to give a shout out to Tony because I didn't realize he said nice stuff about us, but you know, two of the very best of what they do. Thank you, Tony, um, for the, for the kind words, um, worked alongside. I actually Tony. didn't realize, I didn't realize Tony was a senior either. So, um, Tony, you senior. So, Oh, I you don't want to mess with, with, uh, with, with junior, his, his son is a, is a badass wrestler. And so, so little Tony will, will get you. I think I've seen that. I've seen that. Yeah. Probably Big Tony too. I, he would take me out in a heartbeat. He's got the coolest hair of any flipper too. I just want to say that. For the record, <laughs> let the record state. Yeah, yeah. He's got some pretty, some pretty cool hair. Um, so there's all your compliments back at you, Tony. Thanks for joining. Thanks for the kind, kind words. All nighter hider. Um, absolutely picky. If the hurdles are high, I'm going to scrutinize which one I jump. Um, you know that that is for sure. Buyer sentiment is. Uh, they're going to be a more picky when it's uh, expensive. If uh, iPhone's charging you eleven ninety nine for the latest model, I'm going to make sure it's it's worthwhile to do the upgrade. No, definitely. Oh, and um, you know, Matt, one other thing I was going to say for 2024, um, new construction is poised to be more vibrant again this year. Um, as long as rates don't do anything crazy, it's just with less attention, with fewer sellers coming to the market, that gives advantage to brand new homes. And so I think we're we're poised to see, you know, strong numbers. I don't know if we can, you know, exactly meet the 2023 numbers, but um, but it looks it looks good. It's not going to be this dull year where we're missing 40% of new sales. Um, last year was the exact opposite trend of the existing sales market that was down by 40%. Um, new construction was still you know, a top three year out of the past 10 years. And so um, pretty remarkable to, to watch. In Sacramento and surrounding, was it like 27 or 30% of the market was new construction of the, of the sales? Yeah, so 27%. And so when you add like all the existing homes and the new construction on top of that, new construction was 27% of everything in, in the greater region, um, which is a huge number. Um, the only time... I'm aware of that where we saw a number that big was in 2002, you know, where we had about 9,500 homes built, um, more like 6,500 this year. Okay. So we don't, it's not like the new construction isn't robust like it was in the mid 2000s, but, um, but really a, a strong year, which is just, you know, stunning to see. And, but, you know, it's not happening without builders, you know, buying down the rate and offering concessions. And so this isn't happening, just, you know, buyers are camping out. That's, that's not the case at all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Builders are, are in a in a good spot. And depending on who you look at or who you listen to, you know, there's a shortage of housing. And so they're, you know, bringing that needed uh, product to market. And while they're doing that, they're also solving the problem of affordability by saying, will give you a discount on your rate to make the home affordable. So um, as much as mortgage people will knock builders for, you know, having in-house lenders and competing with them, you know, they're, they're, they're filling a void in the market and they're um, seizing opportunity <laughs> that's there. So um, yeah. kudos to, uh, to the builders, just make me your preferred lender in the future, please. And, and uh, not somebody else. Um, I want to answer this one. Cause I think this is one that is a really good common question. I know that Brian Adams already has some feedback for him because Brian Adams um, is in a situation where, um, you know, he's choosing to, to, to wait to buy. Um, hey, Matt, is now a good time to buy or should I wait to buy? I'm 30 and single, not in a rush, make over 200,000 and have 300,000 for a down payment. Kudos to you for having huge reserves, huge down payment, a great job, um, Sounds like you live in a market where, you know, home prices are a little bit more expensive, 700,000. Um, 
I think Brian said, when you're ready, that's the best advice. I agree wholeheartedly with that. I'll let, I'll let you chime in too, Ryan, um, after I, you know, um, rant a little bit. Um, it's, 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 this is such an individual question and it's like, there's no such thing as timing the housing market. So it's like when Sal Salman, is that how you pronounce the name? Whatever it is. When you're in a position where you look at your finances and your budget and you break down the numbers and you get pre-approved and, you know, if you put 250, that 300 down, what does that mortgage payment look like? What change from your current rent to that? Like, is that going to cause for your monthly budget? You'll know when you're ready and you're the only one that can answer that question. It's great to talk to a mortgage advisor that can give you the, the information and show you the numbers. And that's something that, you know, I think me and my team pride ourselves on. We're providing education and information. And ultimately the buyer is going to decide when's the right time to buy. Um, and so that's, that's the overarching advice is like when you're ready, just like Brian Adams says, um, that's, that's the best time to buy. What else, what, what other advice do you have, Ryan? Yeah, I agree. Um, I think a lot of people online talk about housing, like it's this thing that's so easy to time, but I think, um, you know, lifestyle and finances don't always line up perfectly with market conditions. And so I'd say that, yeah, would it have been better if you bought in 2012? Of course. Would it have been better than the late 90s? Yeah. Well, what about the 80s and then the 70s? You know, I saw one um, housing podcast host and I thought her tweet was so golden. I forgot her name, but she said, you know, I really should have bought a house when I was in seventh grade, but I just wasn't ready yet. You know, <laughs> and so and I concur, man, if I wasn't listening to so much Def Leppard and Bon Jovi and whatever at the time, like I, I would have been buying a house. Right. Um, but it just the reality is, is it you know, my lifestyle and certainly my finances, whatever allowance I had, if I even had some, it, it wasn't lining up. And, and so I just always tell people, you know, make sure that you're comfortable with the mortgage payment. And, you know, what if prices did go down in the future? Would you still be comfortable with that? I think that's a viable, honest question. But, you know, what do you need? Who do you want to do life with? Where do you want to live? I, I think we can't underestimate those things. And I would say the same thing in 2012, compared to 2024, that advice will be consistent. I love what Logan Matashami says so of Housing Wire. You know, he's like, hey, I, I don't tell people what to do. If you're a, you know, grown ass man, you know, make your own decision. And I, I like I like part of that because it just it just really just says to the person like, hey, do what's going to be best for you. Um, it doesn't matter what anyone else says. You know, if the market's not good for someone else, that doesn't mean it's not good for me. If the market's bad for someone else, that doesn't mean that it's bad for me. And when we say that the market is only one thing for everyone, then that's pretty narrow minded. Um, if I could just, you know, rant on that a little bit, because it, there's not a one size fits all market. Um, and that that's certainly the case. For sure. Good stuff. Yeah, I, I like this, Salmon. Buy, buy when you're ready. Um, Rashad. Mirza, local real estate agent, hope you're well. He wanted to know what area um, Salmon is in. So if you're still if you're still there, Salmon, let us know um, just out of curiosity. Um, median home price is 700. Um, yeah, who knows? That could be that could be anywhere, right? Um, could be anywhere. Yep. Cool. All right. Well, I got SacramentoAppraisalBlog.com up on the screen. Um, I just noticed you posted something on Valentine's Day. Jenny was okay with you uh, working working that day, or you got all the work done before? And you know, uh, honestly, we're not really big Valentine's uh, celebrators. We've always looked at it like it's just some made up Hallmark holiday. I know that sounds totally jaded, but um, <laughs> we always do something. We just don't make it a big deal. But yeah, she's uh, she was okay with me. She didn't yeah. pull the uh, you know. <laughs> she didn't get mad that I blogged. So. I, I I really crushed it on Valentine's Day because uh, um, my wife, the, we had storms in Sacramento, which other people from other parts of the country might not know about. Um, but my wife had these little uh, frogs in the garden, like a little Zen frog that was made out of whatever the pottery stuff is made out of. In those storms, something fell and cut this frog's head off, Ryan. And she was so oh. devastated. I had to go to like, three or four different green acres in town to find it. And I found it and I put it on the counter with, you know, some Valentine's chocolate and, uh, you know, every once in a while, 
as a husband, you just, you know, you do, you do right. And so I feel, I feel good about, um, my Valentine's day surprise. I, I really crushed it. So I wanted to give myself a pat on the back there. Hey man, way to go. You sound like <laughs> a heavyweight. Did you, Hey, did you show everyone your belt yet though? I haven't shown anyone my belt. I'm glad you brought it up. So first time ever speaking at this event this weekend. So shout out to Mike Zuber, one rental at a time. Great idea. If you're holding an event, you want to give the speakers something cool that they're going to remember. I got myself a championship belt and this thing must weigh like five pounds. I don't know if you can see it on the screen, but that's got my picture in the middle. That's insane. So it's got a picture. It says, Matt, the mortgage guy, one rental at a time. I'm a go-giver because I'm trying to give people good information and then do the work on this side, which is uh, Mike Zuber saying for real estate investors he's working with. They got to do the work. So I am now a world champion of the mortgage industry, a world champion of something. I don't know. That is so epic. Um, I, and just to throw it out there, somebody, I want one of those someday invite <laughs> me to speak. I'll reduce my fee just for that. <laughs> but that that's seriously so customized and personal and, uh, yeah, that's, that's amazing. Oh, are you going to hang it up in your office or, I mean, or just wear it every day? Like, no, I think I'm going to hang it up in my office. Uh, one of my buddies, you know what he said? He said, Matt, you got to get, uh, some pants with like uh, big enough loops so I could just like have it go through my belt loops and just. I should just, this should just be a daily, a daily wear, right? Oh yeah. You know, um, but you probably need some speedos. So I'm just saying <laughs> if you're going to complete the look, so um, just complete the look with, yeah, speedo. I watched some, some Hulk Hogan stuff the other day. So I got to practice like my pose like, Oh yeah, brother, brother. Yeah. <laughs> we're definitely, we're definitely some eighties kids talking about Hulk Hogan and whatnot. Oh, uh, Simon said TSA gave him crap. They definitely had two letters in my checked bag that they checked my baggage and they put like one of them on top of the belt. So I know they were, they were sweating me from, um, flying back from Vegas for my belt as well. Wow. That's wild. Yeah. All right, cool. What other, let's see if I missed anybody. Freedom works. Hello. Hello. Martha agrees with Valentine's being a scam, Ryan, which most Freedom of us work. probably probably do whoever whoever's behind it it's great marketing You've done great work you made millions of dollars so congratulations to that all right i guess we, we better wrap up man i know you got to finish up that appraisal i appreciate your time man this was uh fun we'll uh we'll try to do this once a quarter if i hold an event in 2024 and i invite you hopefully you don't have a championship belt by then yeah. Yeah. No, those, those are pricey. So props to Mike. <laughs> hey, Matt, thanks for doing this. And thanks everyone for joining. Um, I had a lot of fun. I hope that everyone walked away with a few little nuggets, but otherwise just hey, great to break up the day. Good to have some conversation. Yeah. Good stuff. Thanks, Ryan. Hey, thanks, man. Later, brother.